Uh, today in the Black Belt track, we're going to have uh, four talks, two with a networking theme and then two with an orchestration theme. Uh, so in the networking theme, uh, first Cynthia Thomas is going to talk about uh, Cilium, which is um, a project and a framework to do lots of really interesting things, one of them being uh, Layer 7 security uh, using BPF and XDP. Uh, there was a, a kind of prequel to that talk in Austin um, where we had a kind of first overview of the kind of things you can do with Cilium and BPF and that includes blowing up Death Stars. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to give you much details but uh, you should check that talk uh, later because it's, um, it, it, it's a kind of good um, introduction to this. So, that, But now we are going to um, view a kind of next step uh, for that. So we're going to do kind of go deeper in the in layer seven uh, packet analysis and filtering. And we are also going to talk about DDoS mitigation. Uh, so for this first, first talk of uh, the Black Belt track today, please give a round of applause to Cynthia Thomas. Thank you. Hi everybody. Thanks Jerome. Um, so welcome, good morning everyone. Uh, so how many of you have heard of Cilium prior to DockerCon? Okay, awesome, I love you. And actually using it, tried it, tried to test it out? A few, okay, that's no problem. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar, as Jerome mentioned, um, you can identify Cilium as a layer seven or application-aware security for microservices. Uh, so I myself am also actually pretty new to Cilium, the Cilium project. And here today we're gonna talk about the, it, Cilium and its ability to be a kernel native security. Um, as well as uh, D the DDoS mitigation capabilities, uh, leveraging BPF and XDP, as Jerome had mentioned. Um, so if that's a whole mouthful, don't worry, I'm gonna walk you through it. Um, if you have any questions, we'll take questions at the end, and, and we have a booth uh, in the expo hall as well. Um, so yeah, let's get started. Yeah, as Jerome mentioned, you know, actually this is a bit of a, a follow-up to this Austin talk. Uh, so Gordon is back. So those who aren't familiar, Gordon actually was an intern at the previous DockerCon, and he was actually in charge of writing some code for job postings and, and posting them to Twitter. So as an intern, it was a little iffy, you know, could have been prone to some bugs, but at that time he learned that he can use Cilium for HTTP-aware um, fine-grained policies, and so he kind of protected himself from embarrassment by, by leveraging Cilium there. Um, so now we're at uh, DockerCon um, in Copenhagen, and he actually got a job at Lego. So let's, let's find out what he's doing at Lego. Uh, so his first project is actually supporting this robot competition. Uh, so this robot competition is supported by this, uh, these microservices on the back end. Um, it's been launched by the, the local marketing team, and it's specifically uh, for Danish residents. Um, so people, all these Lego lovers, are, they want to basically build and code with Lego, these Lego robots, and then upload their, their images and videos to, this, um, to the website. Uh, so the upcoming deadline is coming up, so they're expecting tons of media to come in. So just to give you a view of the, the sort of microservices architecture, it's kind of overly simplified here, but just to give you um, an idea of, uh, of, of the use case here. Uh, so everything in orange is basically the new, the new microservice architecture deployment. Uh, so it's the new microservices that are supporting this robot competition. Um, Lego has already deployed some microservices and shared services. So the things in green are examples of shared resources. So here it's uh, this Kafka cluster. And then already existing microservices. So there's things that Lego has implemented before. Some user data inventory, customer um, shipping type information on the back end. Um, so basically with this um, robot competition, these uh, competitors are going to go into this front end, they're going to upload their images, it might get processed and verified, compressed, let's say, and then stored in this uh, data store in the back end. And then of course there's these other microservice tasks like the admin tasks and auditing tasks that um, the various administrators might have access to as well. So Gordon needs to support this, this deployment. Um, so let's go through some of the, a few of the tasks that he has um, to deploy. Um, basically, the first thing he's going to do is use some of his already existing knowledge on Cilium to deploy HTTP-aware security and apply that to the microservices. So protect you know, the existing microservices that are already deployed, ensure that his new microservices aren't going to mess anything up, and, and they basically have least privileged access. 
Uh, the next thing we'll look at is how uh, Gordon can isolate the, the Kafka topics. So again, as I mentioned, this is a shared resource at Lego. Um, there's old services using it, and then these new ones are also going to be sharing the same Kafka cluster. Finally, you know, because uh, we're expecting a lot of uploads and it's a competition after all, uh, you know, we, we, Gordon needs to protect against DDoS mitigation. So we'll talk about how we're using Express Data Path and Berkeley Packet Filter to do some of those things. So let's talk about the, the first task. So he needs to update the HTTP uh, policies for to protect against some extra services. So this next section is a bit of a recap of what um, those who might be familiar with Cilium um, from uh, existing capabilities. Uh, so talking about uh, the the application uh, design and delivery at Lego, the good news is they've already moved to this microservice architecture. So they went. Um, from the, the previous monolithic, slower rollout of software. Uh, they virtualized at one point, and now they de deployed uh, microservices. Uh, the problem is they didn't really keep up on the network security side. And it's not totally their fault. You know, they're using the existing tools they can. Uh, but the problem today is the world still runs uh, on IP tables. So those might be, is, how, how many in the room have modified an IP table rule? Oh, yeah, so obviously uh, you know some of the problems you're probably um, familiar with. You know, basically you can only parse on uh, the IP address and the port number, right? So let's see why this is a problem, especially when it comes to microservices. And IP tables isn't to blame. It's just it wasn't built to acknowledge uh, the things that are going on with microservices. So for the robot competition, for the sake of this part of the uh, example, we'll, we'll focus on the HTTP calls between uh, the web front end and this image upload service. So this image upload service is basically this large API um, that needs to be more fine-grained for the specific tasks that are talking to it. So, so this API exists. It's in all HTTP calls for this image upload service. Um, you know, these people can like get images depending on the microservice or the administrative task, let's say. Um, the web front end needs to be able to post images so that it can be stored and uploaded. Um, maybe certain, certain images are flagged um, or the images need to be updated. So various microservices might need access to this image upload service, uh, but the web front end specifically should only be able to do this post image. Uh, so that's a very specific HTTP call. Uh, we know. Uh, so in, in order previously with traditional legacy Linux security uh, techniques, we'd probably just use IP tables and open up the port. Um, but the problem is, as I'm sure you can guess here, is as soon as uh, you open up the port, you're exposing the entire API behind that. And that's not exactly least privilege, obviously. So this web front end, if it gets compromised um, or if it figures out, it can, it can do other things beyond the API that it's not intended to do. So we talked about you know, application delivery evolving to at least get to the microservices architecture. Unfortunately, the part that didn't keep up was the network security. So network security had not evolved to keep up with this microservices architecture. Uh, that is until now. And that's because Cilium is providing that API-aware uh, network security policy enforcement. So what Cilium can do and what Gordon remembers from when he, during his internship is that he can use Cilium and leverage it to, to declare an HTTP rule specific to this API. And therefore, the, the microservice has the least privilege, um, only hitting the, the HTTP call uh, required um, for it, it to function as, as, as um, desired. So in this example, you, know, you might define the microservice based on the container ID and then specify the exact HTTP call that, that needs to be allowed. And so that's, you know, in a nutshell, a high-level overview of what Cilium has been doing to enforce uh, the, the API calls. Uh, specifically, we showed the example of, of HTTP. Um, so it is built from the ground up to acknowledge the, the microservices space. Uh, and that's why, you know, it fits. It's a better fit. Um, and it can acknowledge um, the API awareness level as well as um, the container identities and leverage those to enforce policy. Oh, and of course, it's open source also, so you can all uh, check it out on, on GitHub. And I have some links towards the, the end of the deck there to, to point you there. Uh, so what's going on under the hood? Um, so how many people are aware of BPF? 
Okay, a bunch of you, that's great. Um, so yeah, as, as Joe mentioned in, in the prequel and Austin, um, one of the co-founders of Cilium, Thomas Kraft, went over and into details about BPF. So we do strongly encourage you to uh, review that video and you can get more of a feel for uh, what BPF is doing exactly and how it's compiled and how it's getting um, put into the kernel. Um, but basically, a lot of uh, large organizations, as you probably know, Facebook and Netflix, have been very public on, on the benefits of Berkeley Packet Filter. Um, so it's actually doing uh, network processing, security has a lot of capabilities, the, the list of functionality continues to grow, um, and it's doing it in a very efficient and safe manner. So it's doing everything in the kernel, um, it's compiled in a very safe way. It goes through a verifier, a limited instruction set, and that's what makes it really safe to run uh, and even swap out atomically as policies update and as microservices and containers um, come up and down. Um, so, you know, in, in contrast to maybe, let's say, like kernel modules, which are kind of notorious for being um, un inst unstable uh, and even potentially causing um, host resets. So just to give you an example, this is a, a BPF program. Um, so the thing about BPF, you know, you can typically is written in C. Um, as I mentioned, the, the way it's ensured to be safe is you're really limited to the instruction set that you're uh, writing. Um, so you, you might be pointing to particular registers. You're limited to the number of rules you can enter in a particular program, although you can sort of tail chain them, um, tail call them to a certain extent. Uh, but the, the verifier ensures that, you know, there's no infinite loops and it can run safely. Um, but of course, you know, this looks a little bit daunting maybe to the, to the average DevOps or implementer. And that's where Cilium comes in. Cilium comes in to do the heavy lifting so you don't have to look at that. You can basically use Cilium to deploy policy um, in a more human consumable manner. So we'll go over the Cilium architecture. Uh, so there is a Cilium agent uh, on every host where a container workload might be running. It's running in user space. Um, we have basically plugins to Docker, through LibNetwork, Kubernetes, and more recently Mesos. Uh, so these API calls can automatically um, enforce the policy and, and spin up um, what I'm about to show you on, on the BPF side in the kernel as these container workloads comes up. And therefore immediately enforce policy on any traffic coming in and out of the containers. So that being said, as a container, a Docker container is being spun up, for example, in user space, uh, Cilium goes and basically compiles this BPF bytecode uh, on a per container basis, basically. So every, every packet that's coming in and out of this container workload is going through this BPF, uh, and the BPF program is basically deciding on a verdict, like allow or deny uh, based on any policy that you may have defined. And as we saw, you know, HTTP calls is one example of a rule that can be enforced. So as I kind of described earlier, you know, some of these large organizations, these web scale organizations, they are leveraging BPF because it has extreme uh, scalability, it's safe to run in the kernel, um, and it allows for the, this function, functionality, this uh, growing list of functionality um, from load balancing and networking uh, and security. So as, as, again, as more containers come up on the host, there's a BPF program uh, tied to each one, uh, and it's constantly doing the verification of any packet that's coming in and out of these workloads. And the same thing would happen on ingress and egress of the, of the actual host. Uh, so a BPF program would handle you know, incoming ingress and, and decide if it was allowed to or denied for when it's bound to a container workload. So also there's other ways to, um, to basically configure the policy. This is through the CLI agents. Uh, you could do monitoring and various policies that can be extracted. So there's a lot of things that, that can be done uh, with Cilium through the, the Cilium API. So that's more of a review of kind of the, the HTTP calls and, and rules that are um, able to be defined by Cilium. Uh, so the next, the next few uh, tasks that Gordon has are more of the more um, the latest and greatest coming from from Cilium. So uh, the next thing he needs to do when deploying his the robot competition uh, microservices application is isolate Kafka topics. Um, so Kafka, you know, it's been widely uh, used. It's used by a third of all Fortune 500 companies. It's basically a, a message queuing system. Uh, so it's allowing for massive amounts of data to be handled 
um, typically through uh, they're basically entering the Kafka cluster as a streaming. Um, and basically, it's very horizontally scalable. So you can have tons of these brokers handling the traffic coming in and out. Uh, it makes it very fault tolerant and, and wicked fast, as it's, as it's claimed. Um, and one thing to, to note is that it's actually defined, it finds its own API. So it's not relying on HTTP or anything. It's its own API, it has its own primitives. Uh, and therefore, understanding the Kafka protocol uh, requires some work to parse on and to actually um, enforce policy on. So a little bit more about uh, the Kafka concepts. So I mentioned the broker. So the broker is kind of the workhorse handling these streams of traffic. Um, so each topic might be aligned to a particular stream, so there might be multiple topics being handled. Um, of course, this is because of the, the large scale, this can be handling like hundreds of thousands of messages per second, uh, making it you know, pretty superior to some of the previous message queuing systems out there. And then there's these producers that might be producing a particular uh, topic and providing content on it. Uh, then there would be consumers who are interested in those topics and, and they would subscribe to, to the topics. So as the producers um, create the content and send it to the topic, it gets distributed to these consumer groups um, so that everyone's receiving uh, the right data uh, that's produced on the topic. Uh, so those who might be familiar with Kafka, it's basically an API, uh, but Gordon knows that it's way too open right now. So Gordon can't sleep at night and he's wondering how am I gonna how am I gonna lock down my microservices? How am I gonna deploy my Kafka um, shared resource with the existing microservices at Lego with this new with, with these new microservices without you know pissing off the people if like there's some error since uh, Kafka is a, a shared resource. Actually, there's another thing I should mention here. This Kafka broker. Uh, it, it's hugely scalable, so there could be like tens of them, um, potentially, I don't know, even maybe even larger. Um, and actually also back-ended by Zookeeper. So Zookeeper is also a cluster that requires maintenance to, um, to bring up. And therefore it's kind of a big deal, like it's kind of a lot of overhead to bring up a Kafka cluster. So it's typically a shared resource within organizations. You wouldn't go around creating little mini Kafka clusters all over the place. Um, so, Gordon's sharing his Kafka cluster with these other existing microservices uh, at LIGO. So, let's look at how we can isolate these, the new from the old so that we don't have to worry about uh, the new microservices affecting the old ones uh, when leveraging Kafka. So, for the Kafka API, for, for the purpose of this example, um, let's say that the producers can send a bunch of these um, produce messages and it would be uh, relevant for particular topics. So in this, in this Lego environment, maybe there's inventory, there's images for this new microservice, um, users, analytics, like various things, various topics that might be happening. And then of course, um, the consumers would be doing fetches on them, um, on, on all the various topics as well. Uh, but well, let's focus on the, the image processing microservice and how it's interacting with the Kafka broker. So. When, a, so when someone is uploading an image, basically it's probably going to be fetching an image from the Kafka broker because it would have come in from the image upload service. But, you know, as we saw on the HTTP side, the, the similar or existing uh, network security that we have with Linux is using IP tables and opening up the Kafka port in 9092 means all of the Kafka calls and APIs are basically exposed. Uh, and so that's, you know, that's as a big security concern and it's no longer least privileged. So that's what we want to fix. Um, so with Cilium, the cool thing is now we have the ability to actually parse on the Kafka API. Uh, so we can get as specific as which topic do I want to allow talking and from which container workload. All right, are you guys ready for a demo? All right, okay. So it's the latest and greatest. So, you know, please uh, forgive if anything <laughs> crazy happens here. I'll just give you an overview of what's happening in this Kafka API filtering demo. Um, so similar to what we were seeing with these microservices, uh, the orange is kind of represents the new services that Gordon needs to 
uh, deploy. So we have this app one that's the producer and app one consumer on one side. They're sharing the same Kafka broker. And on the bottom is represents, let's say, the, the existing microservices. So the older ones that, you know, Gordon's colleagues don't want him to touch and ruin our, our effect in any way. All right, you guys can see my screen, except it didn't get mirrored here. All right, I'm gonna have to work from this big table down, big screen down here. Where's my mouse? There we go. All right, can you guys read that okay? Or do I need to make it bigger? Bigger? Uh, all right, I have to do some modifications here. Was that big enough? On that first window? Okay. All right. Okay. So as I said, on the on the top left, uh, basically we're going to um, have a producer on one of the new microservices. So it's going to be talking on the image processing topic. And then on the on the right, top right, we have a consumer that's going to be listening and fetching on on the image processing uh, topic. Then on the bottom, um, we're going to basically be uh, producing user data. So this is one of the existing services at Lego. Maybe it's like confidential information that's already existed for customers. Uh, let's see here. Ooh. And then on the on the bottom right hand side, we have um, basically the consumer of those data. So these are the the old existing microservices that are happening. So so let's say there's like um, let's let's recall this is the robot competition, right? So this image processing um, producer is saying, well, that went through when I hit enter, so that's good. <laughs> um, so yeah, basically we have it scripted so that you can we're showing if we're allowing or denying uh, based on policy. So let's say image has a good looking robot. Let's see. Is that working there? Hmm. Well, the image processing guy, let's see, did I spell that right and everything? <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Was well, supposed to show up there. Let's see. But maybe we can still continue over here and say um, user profile info. Hmm. Let's see. So there's potentially a problem with our broker, which is why uh, we don't want to be randomly be sending information on a new microservice. Um, but just to give you an example of basically what uh, is going to be enforced is Cilium has the ability to um, basically show, basically parse on uh, the Kafka API so that you can you can choose which uh, topic and which type of uh, API call you want to make. So I'll give you just like a view of uh, the policy that we want to enforce. And I'll just kill that because I think it's timing out for some reason. Um, but so here's an example of some of the, the policy that we can apply. Um, so for this microservice, in the end, we want to be able to protect that shared resource, which is the Kafka a resource. So those Kafka resources would be launched in a container and they'd be labeled with this app uh, Kafka. And then what we're saying is with Kafka, if my uh, if we're going to create an ingress rule um, and we can, we're, we're going to say anything coming from the app one producer, which was our new microservice, uh, would be allowed to talk on 9092, which is the Kafka API, and then specifically only allowed to produce on the image processing topic. Uh, and therefore, you, you wouldn't be able to have crosstalk across topics, and therefore it would be nailed down and, and zeroed in on not being able to affect other microservices in, in, the, um, in, in, in the cluster. So unfortunately, you'll have to come, well, this makes an excuse, a good excuse for you guys to get one-on-one -on -one demo with us. So feel free to come by our booth. 
and we can further show you about that. So sorry, it didn't work the way as intended, but let's go back. Uh, let's go back. So what just happened? Well, I'll tell you later exactly what the error was, but what was supposed to happen was um, this API producer, uh, or sorry, this uh, app one producer was initially able to produce and talk on both topics. So the topic uh, related to the old microservice and the topic um, that it should be allowed to talk to. And that, in this case, uh, was the image processing topic. Um, so now Cilium gives you the ability to um, identify the container workload that, that you want. So here it would be the app one producer, and then only allow the specific Kafka API call that you wish. And so in this case, it was um, producing uh, specifically with the topic name image processing. And that way you can lock down and protect um, any communication between other topics, specifically on, on the shared Kafka cluster. Okay, so just to give you a little bit more of uh, under the hood of what was happening there also, uh, I'll talk a little bit about sidecar proxies. Um, so uh, Cilium today is actually leveraging some sidecar proxies and Cilium has the ability to have uh, the flexibility to program these BPFs to rather control things in the kernel depending on uh, what the hooks would be or redirect it to the sidecar proxy of your choice. And, and that's how a lot of things are done today, like for example, Linkerd and Envoy. Uh, those are getting redirected into user space and being handled there. But as you can see, it makes the, the traffic path look a bit busy because you're going in and out of user space. Um, also, what this does mean uh, at the end host is several copies of the, the TCP IP stack uh, traversing it uh, and crossing these boundaries between user space and kernel space several times, which in turn is also CPU utilization. And we'll see why that's an issue in, in, in our final topic here. Uh, so what's really cool and happening with Cilium is that uh, what we have in development is doing all this Kafka parsing and doing it in the kernel. Uh, so that means you're going to be saving on the CPU utilization. You're losing a lot of that overhead that's happening uh, between traversing into a sidecar proxy. Uh, so that will mean like lightning fast um, policy enforcement for some of the things that we were just demonstrating. Okay, so... Gordon, at least, has been able to isolate uh, the Kafka topics from the new uh, microservices and the old microservices. So his final task is to actually protect against DDoS mitigation. So let's, let's recall this, this robot competition. So basically, this has been limited only to Danish residents. Oh, yeah, I forgot to remind you, this is a fake competition, so you shouldn't be going to <laughs> the LEGO website and searching for this. But... Um, so they're expecting a lot of uh, DDoS because you know all these tons of people are trying, might be trying to get in from other countries. They want the, the, the grand prize. And of course, to protect against all those anti-LEGO activists out there. So um, here we're going to focus on the part of the architecture where it's the end user inbound into the, the web front end. Uh, so you know we can like, gather a list of the external countries, IPs, insiders, protect against those. Um, and any unwanted ones, or you know, whitelist the ones, the ciders that we want. Um, so how are we going to do this and protect? Well, I guess we kind of gave a hint because we already said how we're going to implement it, and that's you know with BPF, the Berkeley Packet Filter in the kernel. So what's specifically happening here is uh, leveraging XDP. So XDP is Express Data Path, and that in turn is a framework that enables uh, running BPF right in the NIC driver. Uh, so that means you're handling the inbound traffic as close to the edge or inbound as possible. Um, so it's not, even going, it's not even going through this host's pipeline. It's not going towards uh, the TCP IP stack. It's happening as soon as possible and therefore saving a lot of the, the CPU utilization uh, that's associated with uh, traversing the TCP IP stack to make those decisions. 
So this term might be familiar to some who have uh, been following Cilium um, and, and Facebook who have published this. Um, it's basically showing just the throughput, the sheer throughput of handling XDP um, versus IPVS. So some of these examples are Facebook, I think they're using it for load balancing, um, but what, here we actually are looking at enforcing policy and security um, and therefore being able to allow um, good traffic to go through and drop a lot of bad traffic. So this is sort of a simplified diagram of some of the testing that we've done internally with XDP just to get some numbers. Um, so basically what we have is just back-to-back -back workstations, uh, one side packet generation uh, with 11 and a half million packets per second. Um, just to make the rule set as like, crazy as possible, we use the, the 10 slash eight and for every single slash 32, we made a rule. So it's like 16 million rules. And then we have legitimate traffic that's just netperf and pings that are to the legitimate interfaces. Uh, and so basically so what, what this revealed were some astounding numbers that are amazing for XDP. Uh, so basically XDP has the ability to drop these basically at a line rate. Um, so the attack in comparison to IP tables, IP set, which is uh, requiring a lot more um, processing and handled further later in the um, Linux pipeline. Um, it wasn't able to even handle uh, the, the traffic rate. So here you see that the drop rate is much lower, and that's because uh, basically IP tables and IP set, they're not even able to retrieve it from the NIC. It's getting dropped before that, not even handling, which means obviously it's not making smart decisions, it's just dumping everything because it can't handle anything. Um, so one of the, another measure that we did was like time to load these rules. This is like a vast number of rules. Um, and actually what's interesting about this is loading these rules on the fly while the DDoS attack is happening. Um, so it's 30 seconds versus like three and a half minutes. Um, so XDP, it can load these rules uh, with no stress, you know, maybe in about eight seconds, so it's a bit more under stress, uh, but it's a huge difference for uh, compared to IP tables. Then obviously, so latency under load, this is round trip time for those legitimate packets that are making it through. Um, as you can see, you know, it's probably not even a guaranteed or good number from the IP table side since it may have been dropped uh, well before any decision was made. Um, but by XDP, it's like magnitudes less than uh, IP tables. And so, yeah, as you can see also the throughput under the DDoS attack is just with magnitudes different when leveraging XDP. And that's just because you have this ability to handle it right as it's entering the Linux kernel on the physical host, uh, as opposed to passing it down the pipeline and having like IP tables and IP set um, looking at it. So in turn, what we uh, saw that Gordon was able to do while deploying this robot competition microservices app, uh, he was able to use his existing knowledge of Cilium in order to enforce HTTP aware um, definitions and policies. Uh, so you could secure HTTP traffic. This means like these, when you're opening a port 80 or whatever this API port might be, uh, you wouldn't have access to everything beyond uh, and therefore you have least privilege for these microservices. Next, he, he made his colleagues feel good in terms of he didn't have to uh, affect their existing resources leveraging the, the Kafka cluster. He was able to isolate the topics for the, for the new and the old microservices leveraging the, the Kafka cluster. And then finally, he was able to mitigate the, the DDoS attacks uh, with XDP and BPF just, be, just from the sheer processing power of handling it in the NIC driver. Uh, so just to give you a little update of the, the Cilium project status. So uh, this month we're releasing version 0 0.12. Uh, probably since the last update, we have integrated also some Docker Kubernetes as well as Mesos integration. Uh, we're also always looking for uh, feedback and contributors. So happy to have you uh, send those along our way. But we also want you to take action. We want you to try it yourselves uh, and get your hands on it. Um, so we have Getting Started Guy using Docker. You can check out our documentation page here. We have a Slack community. So you know, once you start playing with it, we have our engineers ready to help and, and uh, communicate with you and see what your use cases are. Uh, and finally, check out our website uh, for more information. We also love you once you're, once you're on GitHub getting our code. If you could star us, we really appreciate it. 
Um, so that's what I had for today. <laughs> I hope you learned something new about what Selim's doing uh, with the latest and greatest that's uh, out there. Um, so check us out on GitHub. Follow us on Twitter. So we expect to have a blog on this Kafka isolation uh, very soon. If you follow us on Twitter, you'll be able to get that update as soon as possible. Um, for those who haven't been able to visit our booth yet, please come by the Expo Hall. Uh, we'd love to chat more about you, uh, more about uh, Cilium with you. Uh, and we also have shirts and other giveaways. So um, with that said, uh, thanks for your attention. And we're up for Q&A. Paul. For people who have questions, I invite you to walk to one of the three microphones that are located on the front in the middle and on the middle point of the room on left and right sides. It's just like the um, you know emergency exits in airplanes. They might be located behind you. <laughs> <laughs> questions? Hi there. Over there. Yeah, uh, I have a question about. Um, uh, I see that you can you can filter and make rules on layer seven. Yes. But what if you want to have uh, TLS communication between your services? Right. So can you still use Cilium for this? So Cilium will be able to leverage something once uh, KTLS functionality is embedded in the kernel. So it's upcoming functionality that needs to be upstreamed, and then that's something that Cilium will be able to leverage for sure. For so TLS. once the TLS happens in kernel yeah. space. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Yeah. Hi. Um, Hi there. Hi there. Um, so, what's up with uh, debugging? So, if you have it in production and PPF is starting dropping packages at a rate like I don't know, what's yep. going on there? Yep. Do you have tooling for that? Yeah, for sure. So today we have you can use just basically the CLM or CLI for Cilium, and so we have monitoring and tracing functionality right there. It's all basically command line right now for for the that's part of the open source project. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, maybe maybe a valuable question is uh, what kind of NICs support XDP? And uh, so there's a there are various number of NICs that support it natively. Um, I'll have to go back to the specific list, but it, it's it's a well known um, framework that most NICs modern NICs are going to be okay. supporting. Cool. So Thank it's you. not some one off thing. Yeah. Yeah. More questions. Okay, so, um, oh, sorry. I guess in the meantime, I forgot to add, uh, there is a Star Wars demo for those who have seen it in Austin. You can try it out yourself uh, from our website. It's, uh, is it cilium.io slash uh, Star Wars demo? So yeah, so it's a fun one, yeah. So are you guys um, Kubernetes manifest aware so I can specify the policy in terms of how I specify the manifest rather than having to use port numbers and things like that, or? Yeah, so basically we're leveraging the Kubernetes network policy, and then for things that aren't standardized within the, the Kubernetes network policy, we have the, the custom resource definitions to extend beyond that. So I don't have to use port numbers and things like that, I could use the exactly. service Exactly, yeah, yeah, you're okay. using the, the container app label, yeah, yeah, and then yes. you're, and then beyond that, whatever you want to do. And what about yeah. Istio and Linkerd and things that uh, you... Yeah, so I mentioned when I was talking about the sidecar proxy, yeah. uh, so things that you want to leverage, Cilium has the flexibility to point to those things. Um, so that could be leveraged within a BPF program. Um, so we're integrating also with Istio, so we're complementary to Istio, uh, but we're actually specifically focused on this application-aware security. Cool. Yeah. Sorry, just one, one question. Yeah. Uh, what's the... So it does Cilium also do things in respect to connectivity between the containers? Uh, can you do like do you, do you do things like uh, I don't know VXLAN? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, so on a I sort of demonstrate uh, what the diagrams I showed today were container workloads. Maybe it was depicted as on the same host, but definitely we have two modes: direct mode and over uh, an overlay mode for container workloads on different hosts. Okay. Yeah. All right, so I, um, to wrap up, uh, three things. So first, I have to remind you to rate the talks if you like them. If you don't like them, you can also not rate them. But we also <laughs> use Nest. Please rate talks uh, because that's how we know like which which kind of talk we should have for future iterations of the conference. Um, yeah, another thing I wanted to mention is that uh, you, you saw like on the table on the end there is 
IP tables and we know IP tables is already pretty fast and with that stuff we're taking that to the next level. Um, a lot of people are kind of on the level before because we're filtering with user mode proxies and stuff like that and in that case we're not even on that table because I don't know, I think we would drop at maybe not 7 million packet or whatever but maybe 100,000 or something like that. <laughs> so we, we have to be aware that we are talking about really fast things. Uh, and the last thing, which is uh, very often at the, at the end of the talk about the project, we say, hey, if you, if you won't try the project, uh, for lots of us, it's like, no, this is going to be complicated and I don't want to spend like three days to try this thing. Um, I invite you, not specifically for Cilium, but generally speaking, to try things if you think they can be relevant to you. If only to give the feedback that, okay, I tried like the instructions, uh, my time budget was 10 minutes and that's, that's only what I could do. Because today with containers, there are many things that can be really, really fast to try because, oh, there is a compost file or a cube manifest or this or that. And you can bring up an entire stack with load balancers and storage and this and that uh, in those 10 minutes. And if something goes wrong, just by reporting it, just by saying, hey, I tried your thing, but it complained about whatever, uh, you can help that project a lot already because the, the goal for many of us, when you write some really cool code like that, you want people to be able to try it. So when I, I kind of um, invite you to tinker and try things, even if it's only to, to say, well, no, that, that the installation instructions didn't work, because even that is useful to, to these projects. Thank you. And the can, next. Can I uh, add sure. to that? Yeah. We actually have really simple getting started guides. So you can try uh, Cilium in a Docker container, and it's super easy. Like, you can just launch a little Vagrant uh, VM on your laptop and get going and play with Cilium right off the bat. So it's, but we also love your feedback as well. You can join Slack and tell us if that works for you. So thanks.